Jeffrey Gray wrote a book called The Neuropsychology of Anxiety, man, and that is a great book. It is impossible to read. It took me really, it took me like six months to read it. And the reason for that is that he reviewed about 3,000 papers, and they were all neurological papers and, and, and heavy psychological slash biological papers. He actually read them all, and he understood them, and he synthesized them. And then he wrote this book about the synthesis. And so, and he's very, very careful with his terminology. And so to read the book, you have to understand brain anatomy, and you have to understand neuro, neuropharmacology, and you have to en- understand animal behavior, uh, the whole literature on animal behavior, and a whole whopping uh, uh, dose of human psychology and cybernetics. It's like, it's a vicious book. But you really learn something when you read it if you go through it bit by bit. Like, and it, it's, it's, it's had an overwhelming influence on psychology, even among people who haven't read it, which is most of the people who cite it, by the way. And so, but he said, he, he, he outlined this real cool study, maybe it was a sequence of studies, about how to motivate rats, you know, and rats are a lot like us, uh, you know, in, in positive and negative ways. And, uh, you know, biochemically and, and uh, psychopharmacologically, they're very, very similar, and they have very complex social environments, and, you know, they have hierarchies, and they play, and they laugh. Jack Panksepp, Jack Panksepp found out that rats laugh if you tickle them. You can tickle them with, like, the end of a pencil eraser, but you can't hear them laughing because they laugh ultrasonically like bats, so you have to record it and then slow it down, then you can hear them giggling away when you tickle them. <laughs> so... So, which is, you know, you think, well, you're going to spend $50,000 on a study demonstrating that rats laugh. And you think, well, wait a second, wait a second. That's a major league study, you know, because he's outlined a, a ludic circuit. That's a play circuit. And Jacques Panksa discovered the play circuit in mammals. That's a bloody big deal, you know. If you get that by, like, rubbing rats with a pencil eraser, well, good for you. So, anyways, so Gray talked a lot about how to motivate a, a rat. And... You might have heard about B.F. Skinner. You know, he used food pellets to motivate his rats. But what you don't know about Skinner is that those rats were starved to three-quarters of their normal body weight. So they would, they would work for food, man. So Skinner's rats were kind of oversimplified. But you can get rats to work for food. They don't have to be that hungry. You can get them to work for food. And they'll do all sorts of things. They'll press levers, and, and they'll open, bar, open doors, and they'll solve problems. And, you know, they'll do all sorts of things. And one of the things you can do to kind of measure how much the rat is motivated is let's say you've run him through a maze and he knows there's some food at the end of the maze. You can tie a little spring to his tail and see how hard he pulls when you open the door to the maze. So that's because that's how much rat work the rat is willing to do. So you can measure that. Or you can see how fast he skitters down the maze and you can get an estimate about the rat's motivation. And so then you might say, well, how motivated is a hungry rat? And the answer would be, Depends on how hungry he is. But there's another answer. It also depends on what's chasing him when he's going after the food. So if you have a rat and you, you have food over here and you waft in some cat odor, rats hate cat odor and it's innate. They never have to see or smell a cat to be absolutely petrified by cat odor. And so if you waft in some cat odor and then open the door, that rat will zoom to that food a lot faster than it will if it's just hungry. So a rat running away from something that it doesn't want towards something that it does want is a very motivated rat. And so one of the things we did with the future authoring program that's germane to this idea of terror, because there's, there's this idea in the Old Testament that the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. and It's a pretty harsh idea. But, but there's something really useful about it, because one of the things you see with people all the time is that they're, maybe they're trying to stumble forward towards their ideal as poorly defined as it might be, but then they're afraid, right? They're afraid about what they might encounter, and that stops them because fear does stop people. It freezes you like a prey animal, and so people move ahead, but then they get afraid, and then they stop moving ahead, and so, and that's not so good because negative emotion is a really powerful motivator, so we're more motivated by negative emotion than positive emotion, quantitatively speaking. Quantitatively speaking, you can measure that. And that's, I think, because we can only be so happy, but we can really be suffering and dead, you know? So we have to pay more attention to the negative. And that's bad because the negative can stop you. And then in my clinical practice, you know, I'm, I often talk to people who are trying to make a difficult life decision and, and they, they're weighing out the costs and the benefits of making the life decision, you know? And one of the things I always talk to them about is wait a second, that's an incomplete analysis. 
You have to weigh out the benefits and the costs of doing this. And you have to weigh out the costs and benefits of not doing that, not doing it. And that's not the same as the zero that you assume that you're starting with, right? Because to not make a decision also has a cost. And sometimes the cost of not making a decision is far worse than the cost of making a decision, even if the decision is risky. And so one of the things you can derive from that, and this is very useful, I think, is that this is also, I think, why it's so useful to contemplate your mortality, so to speak, is you're screwed no matter what you do. You know, and that actually frees you, is that you, you, you have path A that has catastrophes, and you have path B that has catastrophes, and you don't get to have the no-catastrophe path, but you get to pick which one. And that's really something, because if you know that there's terrible risk associated with everything that you do and don't do, then you can afford to take some risks, because you're not, you know, and this is all within the arc metaphor. I'm still making the case that despite the fact that your life is essentially catastrophic, you can, you can make a covenant with the highest ideal, and that will take you through it the best way possible. I'm, I'm, I'm still making that case. So, so then you think, okay, well, I'm trying to make this decision. I'm going to go try to do something difficult, and isn't that terrifying? And then you think, yeah, but wait a minute. What's really terrifying is not doing it. And then you think about the cost of not doing it. So in the future authoring program, we have people do this little meditative exercise, which is, okay, just... Think about your insufficiencies by your own definition, right? The way that you don't do what you know you should do. About the things that you do that you shouldn't do, that you know you shouldn't do beyond a shadow of a doubt, right? There's some things like that. And that's bad habits and, and poor aim and all of the resentment and hatred and aggression and unresolved conflicts and all those things that are dementing you and warping you. And then think, okay, those things get the upper hand, man. They get the upper hand. And they take you the worst possible place you could go in the next three to five years. What exactly does that look like? And so you sketch all that out and you think, hey, I don't want to go there. And so the next time that a temptation comes up, you think, well, it'd be a lot better for me if I didn't succumb to this temptation. It's like, that's kind of weak, eh? You'd look a little better if you didn't eat like a cheesecake a day or something like that. You know, that's, that's something. But it's not the same as... Um, I'm going to have diabetes and I'm going to lose my damn leg in in, in five years if I don't get my eating under control. That's motivating. And so then the temptation comes along and you think, oh, how about no? Seriously, how about no? Not just because a a higher good would be obtained if I avoided it, but because a, a terrible catastrophe would be averted if I didn't. And so, well, so you want to get your fear behind you, right? You want to get it behind you where it's pushing you forward instead of in front of you where it's stopping you. And you get your fear behind you pushing your for- you forward by actually thinking through the consequences of not putting your life together. And the, the least of those is that you waste it and suffer, right? Because you're going to suffer anyways, man. So you waste it and suffer. That's a bad deal. Because maybe if you're going to suffer, you could at least do something noble and glorious and upright and powerful and honorable and admirable and helpful and and difficult, you know, that's just so much better. And maybe that's good enough so that you think, hey, you know, little suffering, it's basically worth it. At least it's a way forward.